get started, we'll, we're on the air now. So welcome everyone. I see some of our department heads are here, anxious to tell us their needs this year. Looking forward to it. Uh, we'll start uh, with uh, the opportunity for any public comment. We don't have anybody online, right? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we have no visitors online, so. Okay. All right. Then I'll turn it over to our town manager for some introductory comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Glad to uh, be here this evening. Uh, as uh, I made my uh, larger scale presentation on the uh, budgetary introduction last week at the, at the council meeting when we brought that forward. I know all of our department heads have been working really hard over the past few months to, to bring us uh, from uh, both our capital standpoint and, and our operational budget standpoint that we've, uh, we've brought this here uh, over the next couple months for the council to review and make their, their determination and decisions relating the next year's uh, next fiscal year's um, operations and uh, and setting those goals. Uh, as we as we look at uh, this year's budget, we'll, we, we're coming in at 2.88 percent is the uh, is the net increase that we have. I know we did try to. Uh, there are a number of elements that obviously are in play this year, where we have uh, both you know a revaluation underway and the, the larger discussion relating to uh, the school project that is weighing on people's minds. So. A big focus of, uh, of our budgetary approach is trying to come in with a conservative budget that meets the needs of the community, but at the same time uh, is responsible uh, as far as the overhead and, and taxation. And uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Christy Bradbury, our, our beloved finance director to our right, uh, and her hard work throughout this, uh, for, throughout this process of getting us there. Uh, not only were, was staff working on the conversion uh, from NDS to MUNIS, which has been uh, a year and a half in the making uh, to get to this point, but also uh, keeping me on, on track and uh, keeping our department heads in check to make sure that they had all their information to her and, and input in an accurate manner. And, uh, and then over the past uh, probably two months, I know she and I have been working on a, on a hammer, hammer and tong type of approach, trying to make sure we had everything pulled together. Uh, so a, a really a huge amount of gratitude for Christy's work on this. It's been great to, ha great to have her as part of the team and with her efforts for that. So thanks for that, Christy. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank all of our department heads for the hard work that they did to bring forward a, a budget that uh, in many ways, and I think uh, Chief Gleason would, would say, uh, it provides our, our, not our wants, but our needs. And I think that's, I think that's how we take our approach as well. Uh, through the municipal budget side of it. We, uh, there are always things that you would really like to have, but there's things that you have to have. So we try to include that in here. And, uh, and so I wanna thank them for all their hard work uh, to get to that point and, and to bring this forward. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, this evening it'll be, I'll go through the administrative side of it, and then we'll transition to the uh, assessing codes and planning, and then back, uh, I've got a couple of items, then Angela will come forward at, from the elections uh, side of it as well. Uh, then I'll go through the remaining administrative side of it and we'll transition to Chief Young and then to Chief Fenton and then to, uh, Rachel will bring up the, the tail end with our, our TML's budget. So, uh, but that's, that's the format that we have for, for this evening. Sorry. Sure, sure. Um, Maybe I missed my opportunity and I will do it as we go through the detail, but I started with your memo on the front. Do you want to talk about that now? Oh, sure. Or do you want to wait till we get down into? We, we can do it anytime you'd like, Councilor Gillette. I'm, I'm pretty, as you know, this is a workshop uh, approach, so any yeah. questions that you have or questions uh, or issues that you'd like, fire away, because we're happy to, I'm happy to help. Does she have three minutes? Or? No. <laughs> I may have three. I can do it all in three minutes. <laughs> um, and and uh, you may just want to jot these down and we can kind of address it as we, as we go through. But uh, some of the things that, um, I gotta get too much paraphernalia here. You wanna give us a page that you're looking on there? Or? I'm on page three. three. Page three, okay, thanks. I like to start at the beginning. Um, and these are, these are general questions that I, I want to uh, make sure that as we go through that we've, um, uh, we're keeping them in mind. 
Um, and these are things that have to do with um, town council goals. Um, and I know that some of this will come through our climate change report, but I think that um, as we look at capital um, projects and capital investment, um, we need to make sure that people understand that we're very aware of the Shore Road issue in Pond Cove area. And so that's on the radar, even though it may not be explicitly stated in here. But I just want people to know that, um, uh, that it is something that we know that we need to uh, focus on and we need to uh, put some energy and dollars into in 20. 24. The other one is, and I know you talked about this a bit, um, I think at our council meeting, around cell service. I think it's, it's bigger than just um, um, the Fort Williams side of the community. That's also in our council goals that will implement um, the wireless infrastructure study. I think that's maybe a little bit aged and so we'll need to tweak it but I think we need to address wireless coverage from a public safety perspective. So there's that which I would um, like to have represented in the higher level uh, documentation. And then I want to make sure that we explicitly state around um, as our unassigned fund balance we talked that's out here that $550,000 of that is going to be uh, going toward capital improvements. Um, and there's a statement in here which says that um, uh, as we, uh, the fund balance for anticipated future planning for uh, funding reserves, I just want to ask the question if there are policy changes which the town council needs to put in place in order to create this capital reserves uh, account or can it just naturally happen? Um, it's another thing I want people to be aware that we are um, aware of and something that we are um, thinking about and down in as we talk about Fort Williams we can talk about policy relative to um, the uh, the fees the income from parking fees etc and then and this will probably happen a bit but I want to highlight it as I think it's something that is really important because again going back to the council goals is that we want um, citizens to be able to access information. We need to desperately do something about search facility on the town website. Um, I think when it takes one at least uh, 15 to 20 minutes to find something on the website and somebody who kind of knows what's supposed to be there, I can only imagine what people who don't go to that website on a frequent basis are having to deal with. So those are the things that I wanted to bring up to a higher level. I think you mentioned um, many of the other things I would have uh, checked off on my little to-do box. But those, I think, are key items that we need to highlight. Sure. And to many of those as well, Councilor Jordan, and thank, thank you for your thoughtful questions. I, I do appreciate those. Uh, regarding items that we have, such as some climate uh, climate impact initiatives, I know, uh, we want, you know from an operational standpoint, uh, we'll be investigating and pursuing grant opportunities that may come up later in the year uh, that we're, we're looking to uh, uh, to pursue that, and it may end up eventually becoming it, the, the use of a match. It may not be in this year's fiscal year, but it might be in the coming fiscal year that we have to identify uh, those you know, because those periods generally take a good amount of time, and then we'll get into that. But uh, if we'll have to generate a town side match uh, to, to generate those funds, that's an area that we will actively uh, be pursuing because many of those items, which were, you know, let's say eight to 10 years out, have become front and center, you know, within the next one to three more, more reasonably, or just after, after this past winter's experience. So on that side, I, 
on the cell coverage. I think next month's presentation that we'll be receiving uh, from the gentleman uh, and the team coming to talk about uh, a cell opportunity, it'll be a great question to ask them at that point because they have done a full review of the WEMA study and had identified uh, some of the challenges on, on implementing that. And uh, so I think that'll be, you know, for at the April at the April 8th council, council meeting, I think that'll, we, we may receive, uh, council might have opportunity to receive more information on that and, and what other options might exist as well uh, from that side, but it doesn't, you know, to, this is part of that, that, what they come forward with is probably part of the solution, but it's not the, Right. Yeah, exactly. for sure. I, I, so, we'll be, uh, so we may be able to expand their thinking and solutions quite, quite for possibly. technology. Relative to the Pond Cove answer around Shore Road, I'm hoping that we don't have to go through five more storms before something gets fixed. I just want, I want people who access Shore Road, who live on Shore Road, who live in that area, know that it is a priority for us. Yeah. Um, so I just, I don't mean to annoy you, but I just want to You're okay. <laughs> You're not annoying me. You're not annoying me uh, at all. So thank you for that. Uh, and then, um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jeremy. I, I, we can come back to this under public works, I'm sure. But just on that note, I think it probably would behoove us to, even if we don't know what the solutions are now, um, to think about setting aside some funds in reserve as grant match just looking at the pipeline of funding that's coming through for those through um, BIL and IRA money that is not gonna have that many more federal funding rounds left in it, um, making sure that all of our ducks are lined up so that we can move forward on that in, in the coming year would be. And, and one possible solution to that could be to uh, expand our carry forward at the end of the fiscal year and, and identify if, if we know that the number can grow to be a greater amount, then we could look at that and say, you know, like identify it as an item, grant match funding. And we could we could earmark funds in there to, for, for that side of it. Um, looking at Fort Williams Park fees, the, uh, the Fort Williams Park Committee is meeting tomorrow night and they're gonna be discussing that. And so I think that'll come back on Thursday evening as part of that conversation as a result of their conversation tomorrow because uh, they know they've, they've got that under consideration right now. Because yeah. I would anticipate that um, some of those dollars could flow into this reserve account that I would Very like much. see created. Um, and, and so, not, I'll ask it again. So do we, we need to develop policy around that reserve account? So. Um, how would it be operated? How does the, do the dollars get earmarked and all of that? Okay. And, and a good portion of that too, uh, on the unassigned fund balance policy that the council currently has or the town currently has, uh, I, don't, don't, I don't believe you'll have to even edit that. I think you can deploy it based on the way that it's currently structured and you can fund those. It's just setting aside those specific, uh, specific accounts for, for a targeted funding. Yep. Uh, you know, for instance, with Fort Williams Park, you have the master plan. Right. And you, we've got a pretty good idea as far as dollars and cents as to what those outstanding needs will be and the funding needs will be going forward. And so you can look at that and say, okay, we can tuck aside $100,000 for the next 10 years or mm -hmm. you know, for like Powers Road, which we think would be, could possibly be a million dollars or uh, certain elements that you have there if that, that you can fund because it, it is consistent and you know, we do have that updated plan and it shows some real capital needs that, that are prime for investment. Okay. Um, Specific to the website, Suzanne and I had a great meeting this morning, and uh, we're in agreement as far as the search, and I've uh, got some ideas that we're looking to do in the near term and try to do it in the current year's budgetary funding uh, to, to improve the website uh, and vastly improve the search function just because it's, it's painful for, for everyone, even the folks who use it, you know, we use it every day, and there's we know there's some issues there. We wanna we wanna correct that. So, stay tuned for future updates uh, on that side of it. But we're, it's it's currently in play. We know that the technology exists to do yeah. sophisticated search yeah. facility. You know, search searches. So the utilities are out there. Um, it's just one needs to determine uh, what are the 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 key requirements that you need in that. I yeah. and I think. I got some ideas I'll send along to you. Okay. We'll take them, we'll take them. I think I touched on most of the points that you had there. I think you did. Please circle back if I missed, uh, if I missed any. 
I think you did. Um, and, and then the one other question you had, or, or more of a comment, if, if I may, Mr. Chair, sure. uh, on, on unassigned fund balance. As you noticed, uh, or as you noted, in this year's budget, we're using $1.1 $1 .1 million less in unassigned fund balance. That's because we felt it's important to, to, to look at our at the town's UFB policy or unassigned fund balance policy and then uh, try to build up that amount so we can establish those funding mechanisms as, as you go forward to say, okay, once we get that to a healthy level or healthier level, that we can then start putting aside funds specifically earmarked uh, for areas that are of need that we know over the next three to five years. And then a couple of, uh, there's a couple of charts in the, in the intro as well that um, I hope that uh, you'll find, and I want to thank Christy for pulling these together as well, uh, as far as general fund revenues by type, you'll notice that uh, our, our primary uh, revenue source is, is property taxes, and that's no giant surprise there. However, I, you know, one of the areas that we have found over, over the past few years is the pie. We've tried to get the pie a little bit more diversified, and uh, so we've worked on that from charges for services, license and permits, intergovernmental, uh, investment income and other, and part of that is also the Fort Williams parking revenues are also as part of that, uh, uh, as part of this revenue mix, and that's that's expanded over the years. So that's been a decent area. And then looking at expenditures, uh, you're going to find that overall, our um, our personnel costs are, are th from salaries alone are 35% of the overall budget, and uh, otherwise, when you look at how they're distributed across uh, by by departments. Uh, Administration, public safety, and public works are, are sort of right in the largest. Other is the, obviously the catch-all, uh, so there's a number of elements there that are combined in there, uh, but that gives you a picture as to how, uh, at least from the uh, departmental uh, stratification, that you can see how the funds are, are expended, and then, uh, and then you also can see how our uh, personnel by department, <coughs> excuse me, expended, <coughs> excuse me, expenditures are also broken down. That's kind of a, a new change we put in this year as well. Uh, and we, are, we, are in, we are in a personnel heavy business, but uh, overall we uh, at 35% overall from salaries, that's a, a very conservative ratio to have uh, to the overall expenditures of the, of the operations. Can I ask a question? Sure. As I was looking at these expenditures, um, one of the things I, I thought about, and I don't know if if this, um, this fits, because um, from my perspective, public safety has two things underneath that there's two departments underneath public safety. If we could break those out um, and recognize them as separate entities. Um, the other thing is, is that um, something that we're always very interested in and it crosses Departments. I don't know if there's a way to look at Fort Williams as a separate entity. Those are the two things that, in this pie chart, I thought would be helpful. Would be interesting. Sure, we can we can work on that as, as well. That's, that's uh, pretty straightforward. I know, and I did, yeah, as you noticed in this year's intro, we, all, we do have the overall organizational chart for, uh, from the higher level and then uh, uh, through uh, other departments as well from public works and, uh, and the police department, which are more of our uh, hierarchical departments. We've had this for a while, I know, but I, I think it's worthwhile stating that we, in fact, do have org charts yes, sir. for each yeah. department. So, <laughs> all right. Yes, sir. To ride into the administration yeah, budget. Let's get right into it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, one of the items uh, that you'll notice in this year's, uh, starting on page 27, we have uh, the the breakdown of the um, of the line or an explanation of of the line. Uh, this year, part of the organization in the Munis software versus uh, northern data that we had in years prior. Uh, in last year's budget, the, that the overall number for salaries was, it had the managers, uh, assistant manager, clerk, so all, basically all of the administration was all in one lump sum. And then in Munis, they've been broken out, so you can see uh, all those different elements. Last year, 
uh, the prior total uh, was 711,000 and uh, this year the total, oh son of a gun, was, I, I, of course I went nuts on that. Um, excuse me for just a second, I brought the wrong calculator down. Seven, thanks, thanks, Christy. 788, so of, of that, uh, there's a 3% increase in salaries, that's part of that uh, increase. There's, uh, there's an increase as uh, with uh, the town clerk's elevation from deputy clerk to town clerk in salary. And then, uh, and then under the deputy clerk's line, it's uh, it's twice as much as last year, but that's because it's funding for a full 12 months of the position versus six months, which was in uh, the prior year's side of it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, and you might have just said this, but sometimes you talk wicked fast. Um, did you only earn $109 so far this year? Yes, ma'am. I donated the rest of it to charity, but that's just how I roll, you know. <laughs> no, well, uh. <laughs> it says 2024 actuals. Is that all you've earned in 2024? Uh, I'll defer to our finance director who can explain the vagaries of the uh, of that. Why is that number? It's weird. Um, what happened when we converted to Munis? Uh, oh, that's right. The history didn't come over. The history didn't come over. So what we're trying to do now is break it out. So on your sheet, if you look at full-time payroll, yeah. that's where your actual amount is up top, the 387. Enter full-time payroll. And instead of doing everybody under one umbrella, we broke them out for 25. Okay. And then, uh, and Council Jordan, thanks. For, thank you for asking that question as well, because you'll notice. Where Why it says did you that. need a raise? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> uh, the, the, on, when you look at the at the actuals, uh, that's that was the date that the printout or the um, the document was established. So since then, it's grown in other areas. So if you know, for instance, if you look later on, we when we talk with Jay and we look at the salt expenditure, you might find that there were certain amounts that were there or other, uh, it, that, that was the year to date as of the date of that <coughs> spreadsheet, which was back at the uh, you know, middle, of, middle of February. So uh, those numbers are in flux throughout the, throughout the course of the, of the season. Jeremy has a question. Oh, yes, sir. Um, I had a question about line uh, 3100B, the general administration contract administration, general <laughs> assistance Good contract question. administration. Um, just recognizing that we changed our contract for services on that, uh, I wanted to just check in and get an assessment of how work is proceeding under that new contract. Um, and then just for future budget items for like to help readers follow along, um, it'd be helpful to also note on that line where the actual general assistance expenditures live in the budget so you can crosswalk it. Sure, yeah, that's that's great. We can, yeah, we can, we can insert that language in there as well. Yeah, and the, the contracts worked out great. I mean, especially because we were at, uh, well, June of last year, we were pretty much out of out of business, and Opportunity Alliance has made the transition. And we were they were going to stop providing that service. Cumberland County stepped up. They did a great hire. Uh, brought a person over from South Portland, and uh, it's it's we haven't missed a beat. And they provide that to I think maybe eight towns now is what they have under contract, and it's and it's going to grow as they can get more more staffing. So uh, that's I think it's been it's been satisfying for us. It's been less expensive, at least from the from the administrative side of it, uh, which has been you know I mean it's not a significant amount of change, but it's still a better a better deal than we were getting. Uh, so that's that's worked out pretty well. And then and then we'll see later on this evening. And when we get to the human services side of it, that uh, that's where the GA uh, budget itself is for the benefits that are uh, distributed, you know, to help folks who, who are recipients of general assistance. Thank you. You're welcome. There aren't there aren't a lot of uh, uh, many changes in there. There are some. Uh, we you know you will say there are some are some changes as far as the allocation of how we've identified where the funds are expended. Uh, part under the computer maintenance side of it, we are looking to uh, that 
that has a lot of our uh, different softwares upgrades that we need to do, as well as uh, community input software. We're looking to get uh, a certain software that can help us with outreach to uh, folks who may want to have an interactive uh, experience with on, on issues, uh, but we're trying to go forward with that. Um, let's see, and going through on our internet online charges, our, our Google suite, which is down on uh, on page 29, uh, that now is at 21.9, and that's for 100 accounts as we've expanded over the years, and they've increased it, and we also had to include our, uh, in that service, our email archival service is also there, as, uh, as many counselors uh, no, and uh, on different committees and it, with our work, the uh, freedom of access requests have come in more often today than they have over the past few years. So uh, that helps us manage that, that side of it uh, very well, at least uh, more easily than we could before. Uh, we also have our cybersecurity, which is involved uh, in, that side of the, in that side of the budget, as well as our uh, acquisition on page uh, 30. We do have our technology equipment that's, that number has grown over the years, but uh, we are looking to do um, um, additional security cameras that we have. Councilor Reiniger, uh, uh, you know, consisted with your discussion on, uh, on, on uh, information, the technology side of it. We do have uh, an, an, an expanded footprint as it goes to that, mostly on the security side of it with our different facilities that we have at Public Works, at PD and the fire department as well, uh, just to mostly for security these days, uh, but we are in expanding on that. Uh, and then there's uh, device, uh, device replacement that we have on a scheduled basis. And then uh, e-waste removal has gone up. And so this year we're, we're funding it at $2,500 and that's just to dispose of our antiquated materials in a safe manner, uh, both environmentally, but as well as information uh, protection side of it. And then on our uh, bank fees, our courier expenditures have gone up over the past couple of years. Uh, but that's not a lot of real uh, surprises that we have on the, on the administration side. But happy to ask any other questions. Any questions from the You're welcome, sir. And then next will be our ACP. And that starts on page 33, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Um, I know you have a lot of pages to go through tonight, so I'm going to try to keep this as quick as possible. Um, I'm here representing the ACP department. It's the assessing department, code enforcement department, planning department. We have a full-time assessor, full-time planner, two full-time code officers, uh, and two support staff, also full-time, and they take care of all three departments. Um, what I'd like to do is just do a very high level and leave most of the time for questions. Uh, if you look at our budget, you'll see not that many changes. Uh, our big focuses are implementation of the reval. I think that's something you're working on. It is. <laughs> Uh, I'll be working on, uh, for the next three years, the Sawyer Road grant project and having meetings on that almost every week. Uh, we have our GIS, our geographic information system, so it's a mapping system for the entire town. It's housed in our department. Uh, we are again going through a major transition and we're working with our GIS consultant to get that up and running and then coordinating with other departments. Um, and we're, of course, we're, we're looking at updating the floodplain ordinance, which is required by the federal government. Uh, I'd like to go to questions, but I would want to say thank you to Christy. Uh, she had to drag all of us department heads through the MUNIS system as we did the budget, and she was endlessly supportive and patient. I appreciate that. Thank you. Just a quick question for the planner. And while we were talking about the issues of the um, shore road and the future planning of steps to take because of the uh, the storm damage and all that, would that be something that would fall within, would get the assistance of the planner or is that, how would that? 
be? Well, you know, Cape Elizabeth is a small municipal government. All the department heads work together. So uh, that technically is something that would come under the purview of the Public Works Department. Um, but if Public Works, um, if I found out about a grant opportunity or if we were going to be doing something, we would probably collaborate. There are shore road projects we've already collaborated on. Public Works, our town engineer, I tend to handle more of the public participation element and if there's grant applications, I'm happy to work on those. So it really, but I would think, and I'm looking at the manager, I think the lead on that would be Public Works. As a team, yeah. Thank you. Um, I know we've worked a lot over the past several years on the GIS, and um, and so as I see each, each year, so we probably have multiple overlays and stuff like that. I, why do you think at some point in time the investment in the GIS will um, reduce or? might we assume that it's a uh, constant investment in the $20,000 range to keep the GIS updated? I, I, th I, th I think the town has been really good at funding that. And we haven't dealt with some of the problems that other communities have had with underfunding. I think we get a lot of value. I would just point to the two maps behind you. Um, and I, th I think what I see happening is 2012, 20 kind of trending um, because I'm also using that budget to say pay for aerials, which in other towns you might do through other departments. Mm -hmm. um, I have not had to actually come to you and ask for full funding of an aerial. I've been able to work it into the budgets every year, um, hoping to be able to pull that off again this year. But I, I don't see it as really growing more than what it is. Be, you know, we have, we have hardware, we have software. Uh, I think our last plotter, we, we owned it for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So we try to stretch. And, but when we need to make investments, I think the town has done a great job doing that. And other departments use this, correct? Like public works? Yes, and, and, and I, I really, rescue? but there's some limit to how much they can use it because if you don't have it right on your desktop, you don't always think about it. So there are other departments that, I mean, Clint uses it all the time. Okay. Um, codes will use it um, not as much. They tend to use MapGeo. We're, we're working a lot more with public works. Um, I know the other departments would like to use it. Some departments, their only ability to use it is once in a while they'll call and say, can you make me a map of blah, blah, blah. Um, but this, the more we can get stuff out on the cloud and the more people have access to it, I think they'll start finding other ways it could be useful to them. Okay, so it's a department-wide tool across all departments. Yes, but it has limit. I mean, right now there's a licenses sitting. There's a license in public works, and there's a couple licenses in ACP. So that kind of limits people's ability to understand what they can use it for. Um, you know, several years ago, I printed a map of all the dry hydrants for the fire department. We created the layer. We have that map, but they don't really come and ask for it because they have it up in their wall. So it's it's not something we do more. Is I think it can be more interactive in the future. I think that's an important thing to know because it's um, it can be viewed as here's a twenty thousand dollar investment year after year to uh, planning mm -hmm. versus to all departments. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, I had another question, but just on that, oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll find with the transition to pro that there's a lot more options to make those data accessible to other folks who aren't regular GIS users and our contractor is very good at developing those maps. So um, hopefully that will be something that we see more of in the coming years as well. Um, the question I had though, um, I just was curious. So I noted under revenues um, back on page 16 um, that the, the revenues from all of the various fees associated with um, assessing coding and planning are coming up to a little bit more than a third of the overall budget and obviously some of that <coughs> assessing planning support services or costs that are broadly distributed across the department um, I'm 
remember a lot of conversations when we implemented the um, short-term rental about setting those fees in a way that the fees would cover the cost of that burden for, um, for codes in particular. And with some of the investments that we've been making in additional staff capacity in codes, I'm wondering if that's something we're looking at as we set the fees, if there's a, a target, like a revenue target that we're, we're looking at and, you know, to recoup a certain percentage of the municipal investment in the code enforcement office um, through the fees that we're setting. So I'm going to toss that over to the manager. They've been they've grown fairly well. It does help offset it, def, especially now. It's we're we're pulling in twice plus of what our annual software expenses are for that. So it's more than supporting. Initially, we were thinking it was going to support the cost of the software, yeah. just to make sure that that was a zero sum. Well, we've we've gone beyond that now, so it does help offset the overall expense of the of the department. So there are there is some benefit when it comes to that. Well, and I guess beyond that, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, so for example, building permit fees, electric health permits, heating codes, you know, that's coming up to close to the one, 160, 170 range. So, you know, if you do, like, how close does that get us in terms of the cost of running the codes department? And is that something we should be looking at as we're reevaluating re the fee structure? Oh, no, yeah, I think we're we're close to breaking even with the, with the the entirety of that uh, of all the codes specific related fees. You have billing permit fees because we raised those last year. I think it was July one last year where that we increased uh, billing permit fees from where we were to where we are in the current year's budget. So that increased to bring us on the par uh, a par with other surrounding communities. Uh, so we did do that, and then that was in last year's budget. And then you have plus the electrical air, electrical and, and plumbing permit fees will also increase this year as well, won't they, Jake? Just the plumbing, okay. So, but but overall, they've they've yeah. After the update, I think it helps us get closer to where where we need to be. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question on the advertising budget line. In your summary, you said that it's not currently covering the costs, but then you only asked for another thousand dollars instead of the two thousand dollars that it went over this past year. How come you don't? It's, it's like this constant tension, and we know that it's costing more. We ask for what we think is reasonable, and in the end, it's a projection because the advertising is is based on how many items we have in front of the planning board and the zoning board. So the costs do fluctuate a little. And Councilor Jordan, if 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 they're short, uh, I'll, I, I will find it. I know it's only a thousand dollars, but it yeah. just seemed like why not ask for it? Yeah, there's some there's some items that come up during the course of the year where uh, different departments will say, "I need to, I need to pay for this," and if I, if I can find that there's an opportunity in other, uh, oftentimes the administrative budget is where we'll find that, uh, and it depends upon the it depends upon the year. Some years it ends up it, it, they're really more administrative uh, advertising needs versus you know on the other on the other side of it but there may be areas that you know under ordinance changes things along those lines that may be generated more from the council well, I'll take those uh, I'll take those advertising fees from there versus on the other side so we don't uh, don't get shorter on the other on the other end of it that might be it any other questions Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, now we'd be uh, uh, shifting to page 41, and this is a, a fairly uh, brief couple. This is uh, on the town council side of it for, for uh, uh, the funding for the council's uh, different expenses that are there, as well as uh, legal services and audit services fees. Uh, on the council side of it, if you'll notice on page 42, You'll see the 2024 actuals show like $3,291. Uh, the actual amount is $247.40. Uh, there, there was a couple of uh, mis, misapplied items that popped in there. And after uh, getting together with Christy after our council meeting on Monday night, I uh, spoke with her and, and it's been corrected. So 
it's really you're at 247, so we're about fi almost 50% expended for the year. Oftentimes, the funds that go on this amount are, you know, for MMA uh, workshops or trainings that counselors would like to do, or if there's publications or things along those lines that uh, the council would like to have, we usually fund it, find it out of that budget, and then we'll go from from there to other areas that uh, wherever we can find. But we use 500 is, has been the historic number that we've carried for forever. And then on legal services and audit, uh, those are. There's a slight increase in uh, legal from this year, uh, from last year, uh, but that's all contracted uh, for uh, services that we have uh, on that side of it uh, with our Bernstein Sure contract we have, and then audit services were increased two years ago. Well, actually, yeah, last year they were increased, and so this year they're, they're tracking at the same number again, so there was no, no increase on that, on that side of it. On the audit services, um, is that is that covered under a contract? Is that why it's flat from 24 to 25? Yes. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Those are the easiest, easiest three lines in the budget. <laughs> Let's keep going. Angel, come on up. Next we'll have uh, elections and Angela Frawley, our town clerk. Do you have an assistant tonight? <laughs> <laughs> That's nice that you could bring her. Thank you. As the new town clerk, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to introduce the FY25 elections budget. This budget provides for the November 24 presidential election and the June 25 school budget referendum. In an effort to meet the needs of the Cape Elizabeth voters, we in the clerk's office are tasked with anticipating voter turnout and the needs associated with each election. Historically, the town of Cape Elizabeth has produced very strong voter turnout. Cape Elizabeth voter turnout in the last presidential election approached 90%, and as a reference, approximately two-thirds of voters nationally turned out for that same election. It is our anticipated voter turnout that drives our election budget here in Cape Elizabeth. We must closely predict the number of ballots needed per election, the number of voters choosing to vote absentee, number of voters opting to vote absentee in person, ballot clerk staffing levels, and many other factors for each election to come to our final budget submission. It is our goal to submit a budget that is fair and proximate representation of our predictions. The weight of the election's budget lives in the staffing expenses that are incurred during the month prior to each election. Title 21A provides that voters will be able to access their ballots as an absentee voter during the month prior. The election, the clerk's office and election staff tries hard to accommodate all voters with minimal wait times and professional customer service. Challenges that the clerk's office continue to face include the ability to attract and retain election staff who have a flexible schedule during the absentee balloting schedule. We are very fortunate to have a core group of dedicated staff and seek to expand this network of team members prior to the presidential election in November. I am confident that this can be accomplished. Uh, please note the 3% hourly wage increase proposed for all election staff. The hourly rate increase for election staff is something that has been progressively worked on over the years, and we feel strongly that a 56 cent per hour increase for the warden and a 53 cent per hour increase for ballot clerks is well-deserved and is one crucial part of our ability to attract and retain election staff. We are immensely appreciative of their dedication to our community and hope that our continued support and appreciation of their work will be recognized. Additional challenges which are beyond the control of the clerk's office include delayed implementation of the new centralized voter registration system and the continued wait for the state to start the selection process for the new voting tabulator machines. The rollout of the new CVR system lies in the hands of the state elections division. And although we are poised on our end to implement the system, 
and train election staff. We do not yet have a confirmed date. The ongoing delay in the selection process for the new voting tabulators is also beyond the control of the clerk's office. We have not yet been provided specifics, yet we feel it's necessary to provide for this expense in the budget. If the state continues with the same policy, the town would be responsible to lease additional, additional machines beyond the minimum that the state provides. However, if the state decides the best option is to purchase the machines, this budget may not provide the necessary funding. Unfortunately, we do not have further information about that at this time. I am pleased to share that the staffing changes in the clerk's office are going well. It has been incredibly helpful to have Assistant Town Manager Deborah Lane as a resource to me as I continue to learn and look for her for advice on a nearly daily basis. Our new deputy clerk, Melissa Newsom, has been a welcomed addition to our office and brings energy and helpful prior election experience from the city of Portland. Admittedly, we are experiencing some physical space challenges in the clerk's office with three people currently occupying the space that was previously two people. Uh, but our team is looking forward to a very busy and successful election year and as always, we remain committed to providing the best possible customer service. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Oh, go ahead. Um, first one is, um, you highlighted a challenge around uh, not knowing really what uh, the costs are gonna be around machines, voting machines, et cetera. What is it, the contingency plan, so that we may know that uh, we have the tools that we need for an efficient election? Well, from my perspective, I think all we can do is plan for what we know now and what we've planned for in the past. Without any guidance from the state, that's incredibly hard to do, but when it comes to asking for additional funds, we're gonna be looking at the town manager for um, advice on that. And, and with that, I think, and Debbie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've been waiting for the state to provide us with new election uh, hardware for two presidential elections. I think it's been a long time. We've, we've had this at different presidential terms or gubernatorial elections waiting because uh, they were gonna convert to a system and they have just not engaged or, or come to a final decision. So you, if you go back four years, you'll notice that we have a similar conversation again. So we've right, been holding all, right, all this right. time. But uh, we can get the funding that we need to. If, if we need to, we can make sure we get it done because we, uh, it's gonna be on all hands on deck in November. I think I've seen that note on every budget I've reviewed sitting up here. Unfortunately. Um, on that though, I'm just, I'm curious, uh, in addition to the machines, um, and I, I don't expect us to have an answer for this since we don't know what machines the state's going to yeah. select, right. um, but I guess thinking back to perhaps the last time there was a change in technology, um, I wonder if there's any way that we can think about or anticipate um, what the staff retraining costs might be and also what the purchase and transition timelines might look like um, so that we can make sure that we have everything in place for you know the two big days of the year that we've got on the calendar <laughs> absolutely and we like you just said we will know more when we know what those new tabulators are going to look like and how similar they are to the ones we have maybe it's just improved technology within the unit itself um, but yeah that's going to be probably a, a game time decision okay thank you Thank you, a quick question. Yeah. What is the plan f or the approach uh, for completely purging the voter list? Is that something that needs to be a budgeted item? Purging the voter list? Yeah, you know, just ever so often, I mean, I, even when I look at the list now, I can see some people that no longer live in the town. It, it, it affects those individuals who want to do a referendum drive and they have right. to hit a certain percent of the number and the, so the centralized voter registration system is managed through the state and they actually have a schedule by which they go that, and I believe this is what you're getting at, over time it does purge people from the system if they've been inactive for a period of time or they've been identified as moving out of state. 
they have a they have a system in place now if we are notified by the voter directly we can cancel that voter ourselves but um, that is a state system all right thank you thank you i have a question um and this may be for uh, future consideration but i would assume that the um uh, the Secretary of State isn't going to be implementing uh, too much new technology in the uh, September time frame because we're already facing an extremely controversial um, uh, November. So have, I'll just throw that out there that that's one of my concerns. So if we hear there's new technology coming in in September, I would be concerned that um, that timing is not optimum for that is our concern too um, but frankly just because we have received well virtually no information on the new tabulator machines I don't see that as any type of implementation before November we are actually hopeful that the new centralized voter registration system is implemented before then because it will make certain things a lot more efficient as we move towards that election. I don't think it will be in place by the June election, but I am hopeful that it may be by the November. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I am always amazed at how smooth it runs in our town, the voting. We go home and we, we find out within a couple, an hours at the most and we, see some towns and cities and states that go on for weeks and weeks. So I've always been uh, very amazed at how smooth uh, your predecessor and now you will be able to keep this uh, great. Uh, Thank you. A very good place. process has been passed down. Yes. You've, you've had a good mentor. Yes, <laughs> very. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Mr. Chairman, now, now we're sliding up to uh, page 49 should be the public information. And this is the funding that the, the town uses to get our, uh, our information out there from uh, CETV to, our, uh, to the town's website uh, and through other areas that we have there. You'll notice this year under part-time payroll, there's an increase of $35,000 as we're looking to have a shared communication specialist with the town of town of Yarmouth and uh, that those con those conversations continue uh, to try to have an MOU or member memorandum of understanding between the two communities uh, for that but uh, at the same time that will be more of an, in a in a I'd say you could say in a collaborative uh, approach with what we're what we currently do above and beyond uh, where we're at so uh, I know there's a lot of work that's related to and uh, you know Councilors Thompson and Jordan uh, saw it in action last week when on the fly had to, you know, uh, get to, uh, you know, uh, get to the little <laughs> emergency backup protocols were launched. And so, uh, so we do that. We've got some great folks who do who help us a lot more. I know Susanna's done a great job organizing that uh, CETV coverage, and we do have more television coverage today than we've ever had for, for meetings uh, for, from the council through uh, other special committees as they are uh, called together over the course of the year from housing diversity to SBAC and uh, we try to push as much information as we can so all these different areas are, uh, are the areas that we have for funding uh, when it comes to that and also um, that's pretty much the, the lion's share of what, of what we have uh, going on there but Councilor Jordan has a question. Um, it's not really a question. It's um, I think it's something that I'd like to see in uh, future budgets. This is an extremely important part of, of what we do from a um, um, getting information to uh, the very to our citizens as well as ensuring that um, um, we're leveraging technologies that are available today. I would like to see that, like many of the other departments, it's um, here's what we've accomplished in uh, the um, 2020, 2024, here's what we've accomplished. Uh, here's the vision of where we're going 
And here are the things we need in order to get there because the, the town, people in the town are asking us constantly for information. And so, and I don't see any vision around one of the most important parts of, of getting um, information um, out to people. And I think that if you, you consider what this department does every day and the number of meetings that need to be supported, we supported, um, you know, 300 and whatever meetings in, uh, and these, um, like the SBAC or the Housing Diversity Study Committee, the uh, school board, these are extremely important committees. We support these committees in order that information, to get, information gets out to citizens. And um, we, with additional tools in other conference rooms, uh, we will be able to support even more uh, committees and engage citizens even more. That to me, we have to have a vision about where we're going with technology. And, and we can, yeah, thanks for that question. We can, and we can, we can report that out as well as we get later in the budget process to the council because I think it is, it's amazing. I mean, the work that Susanna does, I know like last week when we had that SBAC meeting, while we were meeting, I'm shooting her over stuff that we'd received, you know, during the meeting, and she was posting it, you know, live as we were, as we, as the SBAC mm -hmm. was meeting on that. So, yeah, I think it's a question of uh, just, yeah, if we can write up a summarization of all the, you know, what was accomplished and where we're going, we we can pull that together. And eventually, this may become a full-time position because it is it's so critical yeah, to have your. Um, you know, what is your plan for um, how we're going to, as we talk about uh, ensuring the community citizens can be engaged and informed in uh, the work that we do. I think that eventually someday it's a full-time position. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Moving on to page 51, Mr. Chairman. This would be our uh, boards and commissions budget. And these are the funding that we have for all the different uh, different committees that are out there. There's uh, uh, you know funding for planning board projects, conservation committees work, recycling committee, staff work, uh, special committees that come up uh, that are unanticipated during the course of a year but may need funding. Uh, also, uh, volunteer and staff appreciation is part of this. This is the annual uh, luncheon that the town pulls together as well as other uh, uh, items throughout the course of the year uh, for either staff or, or volunteers that we have. Uh, so that provides that funding as well. And then on the next page, there's also our, our, our insurances on page 52. And this is for our general liability coverage that the town has uh, and all of the, the, that side of it, more of the, the, your traditional let's say, uh, like your homeowner's insurance, basically, uh, comparability. And then there's also, just in case we do have uh, a loss during the course of the year, there's always a deductible that comes with that, so we have that uh, same amount that we've been tracking for forever. Questions on this? From Go on to the next one. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, moving on to page 55, which is uh, the, the benefits side of the equation. Uh, this has our health insurance uh, starting at the top with the number. Uh, this year, we have 59 employees and uh, that are on our health benefit uh, plan. Uh, 35 have full family coverage, 21 have single, and three have coverage for one adult with children. Uh, this year, we're looking at a 7% increase on our main municipal employee health trust, which is uh, a decent number in comparison to others, and we're, we're grateful for that. You always would like to see it less. Uh, we are individually rated, uh, so I had the experience to learn about what individual rating means uh, a number of years ago, but because we have a certain volume of employees, that allows us to be rated on our experience and the, and the claims that we do have here. Uh, but 7% is what we're looking at this year. Uh, Maine PERS, that is uh, our, the town's contribution to the Maine State Retirement Program, which is uh, specific to our uh, officers in the police department, of uh, which we have 30, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 
I had a little thing there. But this is for our 11 sworn police officers, and our contribution rate for this year is 12.8%. Uh, so that's why you will see an, an increase on, on that side of it. And then we actually have an actuarial liability that's out there for, for our uh, employee, employees who have retired as well. We have to fund, fund that, but that's all combined into that annual event. Um, ICMA retirement is the town's contribution to the um, uh, 403B program or 401A program that the town has. Uh, our employees also have, uh, have a 457 that they individually fund if they'd like to take that approach. Uh, what we're looking on this year, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different towns that you, you may notice through reading stories is that they had a greater level of compensation increase, so they went you know, somewhere between 4 and 5 percent. Uh, you may have seen on the gross, gross salaries uh, side. Uh, this year, part of the combo as far as the compensation side was I was looking at uh, a 3 percent increase on the salaries, but then a 1 percent increase on, their, on the employee match, uh, so uh, to try to think about uh, enticing employees for, for today, but also for the future. And we do have a high level of participation on that uh, level of it, but uh, I know in, we also had changed uh, two years ago, the level of compensation, uh, oh, sorry, on the ICMA match for public works from 8% to 9%. So this would be bringing uh, a smaller group of employees, but those who are uh, the non-union side of it uh, to bring up to that equal, equal footing. Do you find most ever of our employees do contribute to hit that match? Okay, that's good. Yes, yeah, we and we encourage it a lot. Um, and obviously, it's you want to think about tomorrow because uh, it comes a lot quicker than we all know, right? So, uh, but I know that we do have. Uh, it's one of those areas that helps us attract and retain employees if they have a uh, you know if they have a good match. Uh, that's one of those benefits that that's out there and it, it pays in the long run. But that does. Uh, it's, it's well subscribed, thankfully. I, I like that they're matching up now to the 9% number. That's, that's always kind of difficult when one group gets one set of contributions and another gets another. So getting those both at 9% is a, is a good thing. No, thank you, sir. And then, and then the other items are unemployment, workman's comp, and disability are your standard, uh, standard areas that we have uh, from there. And then we do have uh, consistently aligned in there for salary adjustments, just in case during the course of the year that uh, we may find that uh, that there's an adjustment that needs to be made either for uh, for an area that may be out of uh, alignment with other positions, or uh, if there are an employee an employee who may find that the the current level doesn't work with the level of service that they do. So it allows us to have the flexibility to to reward uh, outstanding and long term long term commitment. And then our wellness program helps us hopefully offset our health insurance uh, benefits on the other side of it. So uh, employees have the benefit of up to $270 per year that can fund them for uh, different wellness approaches, gym memberships or uh, uh, other, other uh, areas of personal health and wellness that, uh, that they expend over the course of the year. We can reimburse them up to that level and hopefully that helps us maintain a lower experience rating on the health insurance side. And then we have uh, two areas there under professional services and school provided HR and business office services. And these are areas that we use funding uh, that help you know, offset with the town's use of the HR uh, department at the school side, as well as the uh, um, accounts payable, accounts receivable, and, uh, and the payroll expenditures that, that take place in those, those, those departments. So we help, we do a fund transfer at the end of the year to offset the town's portion of that expense. And then also at other times we may need to get additional outside uh, assistance on HR related matters or if there's training or other areas that we want to, uh, that we want to uh, either subscribe employees to or uh, areas that we may need additional outside uh, HR resources on uh, that are above, that may be above and beyond or outside of our, our, legal, uh, our legal services contract. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick question for the town manager. So for the benefit of the public, is that item referencing the one town concept? Yes. Yep. That's, that's pretty much our, I mean, if, if we had to duplicate the same services, it would be substantially greater. But yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, our, that's our, uh, our contribution towards the one town side of the ledger. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. 
Any other questions or comments? All right. I have a quick question. Sure thing. Um, only because I'm going to take you back to uh, um, boards and commissions. Oh, sure. If, um, if I look at, and this isn't a bad thing, I, I don't think, but I just, in, in 2023, we were uh, at 18,442 for boards and commissions. We're now budgeting 36,615. So we've doubled. Special committees. That's, okay, that's what I thought. Yes, Perfect. ma'am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's one, uh, and, and that's, uh, and that's just, that's been more of an experiential rating thing that we've had yeah. that, uh, that they invariably pop up through the course of a year and, and it's, instead of having to come to the council and saying, could you fund this at $8,000 to get us through the next six months of work? Uh, that's, it we've was now budgeted more, for yeah, it. We've budgeted for that, it. I just wanted stuff. to make sure that was the reason. Yes, Thank you. Thanks for the question. Like Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe a good opportunity to invite Chief Young up to uh, to lead us through fire and EMS. All right, come on up, Chief. Well, Stevie, you didn't have to follow Paul, huh? I was hoping to follow the chief there and see how it's done. <laughs> I don't know. How, I don't know how it happened. I don't know. If you guys flipped a coin or whatever, but no, there was no coin toss. I think a short straw, but that's how it happened. <laughs> Actually, I think you should feel blessed because you don't want to follow him. No, I yeah. read his uh, his his cover letter for his his budget. There. He's got a good career ahead of him as a crime novel writer when he retires. You, you can you can find his work on page eighty two. <laughs> if you want to go to your I think it saved you some time. Okay. All right, well, good evening. I want to start off by thanking you guys for giving me the opportunity to be here. It was about a year ago this month that I was, I was thinking about going through the process to make a run at this position and, and figure out what I was going to do if you offered it to me. So... I'm still trying to figure that out. The day-to-day -day <laughs> events get, get in the way of a lot of what we do, but, but I'll start off um, just giving a brief overview, overview of the current staffing model of the department. Um, currently, the department has two full-time employees, myself, um, the administrative assistant that wears many hats. She also serves as the, um, the uh, captain of our EMS division. Um, we currently have one ambulance staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with two part-time per diem members. Uh, we currently have one engine company staffed on the day shift with two um, firefighters. Most of the time, those firefighters are cross-trained as EMTs. Um, that staffing is daytime, 12 hours, seven, 7 in the morning till 7 at night. Uh, excuse me, I, we have three during the day. We go down to two at night on a night shift, that 12-hour shift starting at 7 at night to 7 in the morning. Um, that crew also staffs our second ambulance during the need for second ambulance calls. They swing over from the engine and staff that ambulance. So that leaves the uh, engine with nobody on it, and you'll see that, that my proposal in this Fiscal year 25's budget is to go to three members on the engine 24-7. I believe approximate cost of $135 increase. The only reason that wasn't proposed um, last year is because we did not have the uh, space to have the um, um, third person working on the, on the night shift. We've uh, made some rearrangements at the station. We've taken a storage room and and doing some minor modifications to make it quarters for that third person can, can spend the night at the station, which would bring our, our current staffing levels to five 24-7. Uh, Any questions on the, this 
staffing of the of the paid on duty people? I have one. Councillor Jordan. I probably have three, but I'll go with my first one. Um, as I looked at, um, and I just need just a bit more explanation. Um, we've we are adding a third night shift, so it has to do with a fire truck. So, and you said that the reason it wasn't done previously was there wasn't space for it. So what is it gaining us besides a body? Um, because if we went X period of time without it, is it, how necessary is it? Yeah, that very good question. Um, I will add that the on-duty staff is supplemented with on-call members, but the majority of our calls out here can be handled with the on-duty staff, which which makes um makes the um, early interventions, critical interventions, happen a lot better with the, with the five-man crew. Mm -hmm. They they all respond. I'm trying trying to paint you a clear picture. The on-duty crew whether it's five during the day or four at night, they all respond to the calls together as a crew. But by having the, the um, third on the engine, especially at, on fire calls, we can get you know, a, a hose line in operation and, and a search of the building done right away while we're waiting for the cavalry to come. Mm -hmm. So it does, it, it does pay dividends to have that third member. I mean, as I said, Two of the members now swing over to staff the second ambulance. That leaves the, uh, the engine dead man, nobody on it. So at least we'd have a driver on it to respond to additional calls that happen while the, the two ambulances tied up. And um, there's kind of an unwritten rule or motto in the fire service. It says five and five, meaning five personnel on scene within five minutes makes a, makes a ton of difference starting critical interventions, whether it's on an EMS call or, or fire call. So. That's excellent. I thought yeah. that's where you And there's a little bit, <clears throat> I just want to make a little correction in the, in the narrative there. It, it says to do a minimum required staffing on a fire truck. Three people is kind of an industry standard. The National Fire Protection Association standard is four. But, you know, I feel, we feel comfortable. Most people in the smaller cities and towns run three-man engines. Bigger cities run four. I mean, just to give you an idea, New York City runs six on an engine, but... But for our, 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 um, our construction in Cape Elizabeth and stuff, we're comfortable running three on an engine is huge, so. Okay, good. I, I thought that's where you were headed with it. Um, and I'll just throw this out for future, so you can park this for 2026 budget. Long-term strategy for the fire department. No, and, and I agree with you. Totally. I mean, we we evaluate and plan every day for daily events and in future. I mean, I don't think we want to get into the long-term planning tonight, but we do have a, a plan on where we're headed. I mean, I'm thrilled with the way our model is working right now, but I mean, it's unrealistic to think that's sustainable for for a long-term future. You know what I mean? But we do have a plan to to kind of progress that down the line. But okay. but with that said, we have, as I mentioned, that's that's five on duty, 24 seven staff in one engine company and the ambulance. We are supplemented by on-call engine company, engine 61 that's at Cape Cottage Station, the Quint that's at Town Center Station, the Quint being the combination engine and the ladder. They are, they are um, manned or, or run by on-call members, which is huge. And all, we have over 40 active on-call members that run the those two trucks plus the water extrication team and the fire police. So, you know, just to give you an idea, we have um, roughly 60 part-time per diem members that staff the on-duty trucks with 40 plus members that are on call. So we have over 100 members. So we're, we're a big little department, so to speak. So, and, and I think the service we provide to the, the town, the citizens of the town and visitors is second, really second to none, so. So can I suggest something? Next year's budget, you saw Paul's write up. Well, I did, and I was kind of embarrassed, I and I talked to the manager about that, but I didn't know I had the ability to write a, 
write a. I want you to write a dissertation. <laughs> Absolutely. No, and I've started working on it already. So. Okay. Because what would be awesome, because I saw the number of calls that Paul's uh, department has, and I know that a portion of those police calls, the truck is leaving the station, the ambulance and the ladder truck are leaving. So you have the same, um, I would say, magnitude no, I definitely have some information that I can give you, and I look forward to, you know, other opportunities to give that information. I mean, that just so you know, the department responded to a little over 1,400 calls for service the past year. Mm -hmm. um, that number itself is, 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 is fairly sizable for this town, but more importantly, the number that I think is the most important is our response times. We get on scene within five to seven minutes now where we, before we wait for call members to show up in the middle of the night, it could be up to, to 15, 20 minutes before we get on scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, response time is really where it's at. We can have every member we have and everybody show up 20 minutes, half hour later, but it, it's over. You know what I mean? There's so many times in this business we say, wow, a couple more minutes, this would have been a whole different situation here. So, you know, you can look at the calls for service number, but the, the really the important number is that at response time, which having the on-duty crew gives us. Chief, the one area that I was a little surprised that it was as low as it is is training, because I know the training that... that uh, yeah, that, I know what you're saying. Uh, the training pay comes out of our payroll. So I, don't, I think it's a little hard to, to identify how much time we spend training because it's paid out of the, the payroll line. Okay, so that... You know, the training budget, the training line is kind of for outside people to come in and train with us or, or stuff like that. So, and we're working towards getting more of those opportunities. But yeah, the guys for their training is paid on the, on payroll. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um, Chief, one of the other items um, that I, and this may be part of the, the, the request that Councilor Jordan has, has for that articulating that longer term um, strategy for the department, but in addition to thinking about training, um, I also noted that there were a couple of items in the police budget pertaining to um, recruitment and retention. And I know the majority of our, or well, a significant portion of our fire force is, is volunteer firefighters, and many of them have been active for quite a while, but I'm, I'm just curious for your thoughts on uh, whether additional funding around um, training and recruitment for volunteer firefighters might be part of that strategy or what that might look like in out years? Yeah, I'm not sure where it would be a monetary thing to recruit. I mean, we're out there, we're in the high school now. We've re reinstituted a student firefighter program and student rescue program. We're over at the college. Yeah. You know, I get invited over there to do, do things in the classroom quite often and, and stuff. So we're out there recruiting and, you know, I have nothing right off the top of my mind where more money we'd throw at something would work there, but we're always looking, the doors are always open for new members, and with that said, we've, we've somewhat on a regular basis brought in a few people to the call company, and then they want to go further into Firefighter One or an EMT school that we do pay for, and, and that keeps them around, you know what I mean? They feel some commitment to Cape Elizabeth with that investment in them. Um, yes, you know, I have a meeting tomorrow morning with a with a young gentleman coming in to look to join the department. So it's, it's, it's somewhat random, but, but I will certainly put thought into where we could spend some money in, in the recruitment and the retention end of it. I think, you know, I think we pay our, our uh, part-time employees very co competitively with, with other towns, and, you know, that helps. And, you know, there's a lot of little things out here that make it the place to work, you know what I mean, and the support from this group right here is, is huge and it doesn't go unnoticed by the guys that the support they get from the manager and the, and the council to the, the department. H having had the opportunity to join you for the uh, annual firefighters dinner, I, I, I don't think it's the recruit, I don't think we have a problem with retention. It seems like folks stick <laughs> around for quite a yeah. while. And like I say, great. I think everybody's well, of, uh, well aware of the future of the volunteer firemen throughout the, the state and the country. It's you know, even with that said, um, just the recruitment of full-time members, everybody's having a hard time filling full-time positions in this line of work. So, you know, it is a constant struggle, you know what I mean? So, 
<clears throat> and I think the only other increase we put in in the operational budget was for the for the payroll for the fire police. We kind of increased that to 50 percent. It was like a six thousand dollar line. We've added to twelve thousand, and I think the reason for that increase is is the number of storms we've had this year, starting back to September with the threat of the hurricane. Um, the winter storms we've had, so the fire police are, are a huge asset to the department, as Chief Fenton would probably attest to. Um, they do respond on call, some calls automatically, but they get called out a lot when we have to close roads, and, and we feel having a person um, on standby there for, for the public safety is, is required, so that it eats up the budget pretty quickly. And, and Chief, they were extremely helpful during the uh, control of the situation and with the, with the crash of the Tara Lynn, correct? Absolutely, yeah. They had the fire police had a person on on staff there throughout every day while they were were salvaging that that vessel. So and they kept the scene safe and kept the public away. And yeah, no, yeah, they really contributed to that operation just going as safely and smoothly as it did. So. Um, Chief, thank you. I just, I also wanted to say that you had put in your description, which we couldn't show, that your budget was decreased by $4,000 over the past two years. Um, so there's another reason for the increase is that it has been cut in the past. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. <laughs> I have one, a couple more things. Number one, I, I think we should highlight the fact that uh, the number of paramedics we have. Absolutely, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, some yeah, days, I don't sure we have all five during the day as medics, but I've certainly seen four paramedics on duty here, which, you know, alleviates the need for out-of-towns coming in. I think we've had to call for a, a mutual aid paramedic on one occasion. That was just recently since I've been there, which is huge. That is. It's yeah. Congratulations. Number my next question, I don't know if you're on this page yet, but um, only because I've had experience with this one. The um, uncollectibles for, I guess, for the rescue at uh, um, a significant amount of money, I, only because I had experience with this. That company is very challenging to work with. <laughs> is it, is it, that things are uncollectible or that the uh, situation that happens is it takes so long for them to process a payment, I mean up to two and a half months yes. to process a payment, and then um, the person has forgotten that they even paid that, and anyway, there could be a whole other issue involved in that whole thing. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure how much of an outstanding balance there is in that time frame, but I know I know you are correct. There is a long, long process in in processing fees, and and I think we're gonna. Well, I know we're gonna set up a meeting with that company and see if there's alternatives to just writing a check to them. Whether it could be, you know, another option like a Venmo or something like that, where it's more instant. Instant payment. So. Yeah, I think if people could use their debit cards or credit card to get absolutely, it, it yep, that's faster. correct. Anyway, I think there's a whole issue involved in that one. I, I had a question going back to page 85. Um, so just noting that line um, 1180R, the hydrant shoveling, is a zero line item, zero dollar line item. Um, I was just, I assume that's because we previously had contracted that work out and now we're handling it in-house or have we just not? No, we've always, the guys have always shoveled the hydrants in-house. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure why it's zeroed out there. Um, another benefit to having the on-duty crew, that they could handle the hydrants this year just because Mother Nature was kind of nice to us. But yeah, I'm not sure why that was zeroed out. But it, it I think, it, again, it just comes out of the payroll for the, for the call company guys that come out and shovel hydrants with us. Um, it did prompt me to wonder if there are other hydrant maintenance costs in the budget that maybe live in, uh, probably they, those would live in the public works, or? No, the, uh, fire, the, the fire department trims the grass around them and maintains that way, anything like that, so. But it's done with the on-duty crew. 
Yeah, yeah there's, there's the rental, uh, hydro rental, and then there's also the water, water charges. Water charge. Those are the two that we have. We're gonna look at that, why it's zero, or is it in oh, payroll? The, the, yeah, as, as Chief had said, as far as, uh, I think that's a historical uh, number that had been, been carried forward, but yeah, it, it falls under payroll, because if that's they're there. I thought, it fell yeah. under payroll. Because okay. years ago, you could just go up there and shovel hydrants and get paid. Yeah, yeah that was really good. We were doing good. on a, on a per, almost like piecework when, type of when approach. We were when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, just I would say, you know, just a quick update on the station. As I said, we're, we're uh, in the process of modifying one of our rooms to, to, to bring it up to sleeping quarters for the five-member crew. But after that, we are, we're bursting at the seams there. So we've proposed, and it's in the process with the, um, with the codes department of adding a 40-foot storage unit behind the building so we can get some of the stuff out and, and make some room for us. So, but, but if we ever do go to add more staff into something, there's just no room at, we're out of room at Town Center Station. Um, I would add that currently the department operates and maintains 10 vehicles and two boats, which were in very good condition on our apparatus, or as the manager affectionately calls it, the rolling stock. <laughs> um, so currently we're, we're good for at least we're looking at five years of replacing one of the current engine that we run every day is a 2004 pumper. Um, again, it's running great right now, but we don't, we would not want to go much past the 20, 25 year mark on, on apparatus. So we're about five years out on, on a, on a replacement plan on that vehicle. But beyond that, our, our major apparatus is good for many years to come, which is a great position to be in. And Chief, as far as, and, and Council may also find this interesting, due to some significantly generous gifts that, have, that the department has received, uh, we have, we're in good shape as far as earmarked funds for replacement specific to our ambulance in the future, as well as uh, other apparatus that we may end up finding. So we're, as far as uh, a condition where we're at there, we're in, we're in good shape when it comes to it. So that's a good thing, because those, uh, those units aren't getting any less expensive. No. Sure. No, but <clears throat> overall, I think our operational budget as it is, 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 is adequate. I mean, I'm still every day trying to get a handle on our daily needs, you know what I mean? My, my view of what the de department's needs on a day-to-day -day basis are a little bit different than they might have been in the past, and we're just, you know, moving forward. You know, I didn't want to come in and and blow the whole budget in the first month, not knowing what I was doing, but yeah, so I think, I think we're in good shape. Terrific. Good. Well, I think we're in particularly good shape with you at the, at the helm, so. I appreciate that. Report no, tonight. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Chief. And next, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chief Fenton will come up and talk about our Fire, uh, sorry, our police operation and uh, all things related to that side of our public safety. And that will start, uh, sorry. 80. Uh, I think we're, uh, 59. Uh, 59 would be the beginning of uh, Chief's narrative. All right, well, we're just finishing up a, a great year at the police department. We have been full staffed. Uh, for a full year, which has been great, because at the end of the day, it's about our staff. They're, those are the people who count. Those are the people who make us what we are. Um, so that's been great, uh, but I can't take credit for that. That's the parents who raised these people. We're just super fortunate to have great people that work for us and in their interactions uh, with the public every day. It's something to leave the whole town proud. We do have a couple officers. We have five officers eligible for retirement. And, uh, sorry. We have five officers eligible for retirement. Uh, one is scheduled to retire, he thinks, this spring. Uh, and as a testament to the town, he's having trouble. He's been here over 30 years, and he said he just feels like it's his family. And trying to get done with it is just him processing it. But he's also selecting to try to stay with the town, which I think also you've been here working for the town for 35 years and I want to transition to another job within the town. Just speaks volumes to how you're treated and, uh, and how they view working for the town. In terms of call for service, as I wrote my narrative, uh, our calls were up almost 40%. Uh, to 10,981, that's up from 7,838 last year. 
Uh, a lot of that can have to do with just being full staff. A lot of that is self-initiated by the officers. Recovering from COVID, we're going back into more traffic stops, interacting with the public more often. The largest increase in calls is mental health. It continues to be a challenge for all segments of the population across the board. We're up at uh, 61 calls for service. Of those, 15 of the calls were for people, individuals under the age of 18. Uh, 26 were transported to Maine Med. Seven were taken into protective custody, which means they ended up going involuntarily. That we had to uh, either talk them into going or, or, or physically take them into protective custody. Uh, and as I also noticed too when reviewing the notes, our officers spent over an hour on each of those mental health calls. That's something that we're super fortunate to have, but also as a testament to the officers and their training and their de-escalation. If nothing else, if you have time, then you can resolve a lot of things by just being patient and taking time with people. And I think our officers really illustrate that when you look at the terms of how much time they're spending on those calls. Uh, in terms of use of force, we only had four uses of force in the past year. That's a 20% decrease from the year prior. Two of those were on mental health calls where we were taking people into protective custody. We do have one of the broadest definitions of use of force. Uh, by our policy, I've written it broadly, if you put your hands on someone, that's a use of force. You point a weapon at someone, that's a use of force. Uh, so two of ours were mental health and it was just getting someone to, who's basically squirming away to say, you gotta go in, you gotta be seen. So getting them into handcuffs. Uh, another one was assisting South Portland uh, with, a, with an officer involved shooting where officers just ended up pointing their weapons, but that is considered a use of force under our terms and it was an officer involved shooting that occurred that our officers went and backed up South Portland on earlier in the year. And then the other other use was a, uh, a tackle by one of our newest officers on someone who fled on foot who had a warrant. And uh, the officer was able to tackle him, take him into custody, but there was no, no injuries of any of these uses of force as a result and no accusations of uh, excessive force on any of our officers. Uh, we've completed another year with zero officer complaints. There has been no, no one has come in to file a formal complaint against our officers, for, again, for another year. Um, one of the core things you're gonna find in my, in my budget, which I think is the most important thing, is our training. Our training costs are there, but I think it, it doesn't just fill training. It's our core liability protection. If anyone has ever sued, the first thing they ask is, how much training have you had in this? What is your training been in there? Um, but also feeds into different areas as well. Recruitment and retention. Uh, the last two officers that we hired, the way we hired them, they came to one of our monthly trainings. Uh, when our officers all get together every month and work on practical physical skills. And those officers not only get to come to the training, but they saw our culture. They saw how the officers interacted with one another. And both the officers who came were just checking it out. Both at the end of the training said, I want to work here. And that's how we ended up recruiting. So it, it assists with recruitment attention as well, as well as officer mental health. There's no worse feeling than going on a call and just being not properly trained or not knowing what to do or not knowing if you did something correctly. So all of these things uh, tie into why our training is so important for us. Uh, and we have multi-layered approach to our training. We have our mandatory training, we have the annual training, but we do, uh, officers are sent away to training. We also do a monthly in-house training, which kind of helps bring the group together as a cohesive unit and to make sure that we're applying the things we learn at training away properly here in town. So if you're gonna go learn how to enter a building for an active shooter, I want you to do it at town hall. I want you to do it at our schools. I don't want you at a school in Machias, that's not gonna, you, there are some things that are similar, but I need you here working. Uh, here in town. Uh, that's another thing we've been able to, the new fire chief and I got together this year. We put together the fire and rescue and some of our active shooter response training that we did at the schools. Um, as we're unfortunately having a bigger data set just through, due to more incidents, the days of rescue staying on the outside while the, fire, while the police department searches for the suspect doesn't always work out when you have an injured inside. So we've worked to collaboratively work together to get, provide them cover if we were to have a, a large incident so that they could uh, remove and treat wounded with our assistance. Uh, it was a great training, works out. Uh, it's just, and it's another great opportunity for us to once again bond with our fire and police and rescue squads. Uh, some projects that we're working on is revamping the uh, field training officer program. We're working towards accreditation. We're working on records management a little bit. We tend to have been a little bit of pack rats with our records and we're trying to find out what we have to retain and what we can shred and what we can put online. So the days of bankers, boxes full of uh, old reports, hopefully be a thing of the past. So, and that's, you can see one of my capital projects is getting a filing system. So when we do decide what we need that we can immediately uh, to get that for a FOIA request or whatever reason we might need that old report instead of digging through hundreds of bankers boxes in a, somewhere in the back. Um, in terms of future challenges that I might see coming up, 
Uh, I've been doing some research. It is becoming an industry standard for body cams, but they are quite expensive. Um, so that would be something that we might start to have on our forecast. I've been doing some research. I just read a large PERF article, and that's the Police Executive Forum, which is the foremost data collection uh, agency on police use of force and things like that. It's part of the 21st Century Policing Unit. Um, they just released a, a, a very detailed report on body cams. And so they've been out about 10 years now, but once again, they are expensive, but it's something we're starting to look at and investigate, talk to different departments, see what the pluses and the minuses. There are different types that are out there, but each type have, have their own challenges in terms of retention of those records, how you're gonna release those records, uh, data management, storage, technology. These are all things that sometimes come outside of my purview, but it's something I'm trying to learn a little bit more about with the thought that that might be coming down the road. Go ahead. Yeah, um, number one, as always, I, I love your write-up. Uh, it's fantastic. It gives me a feel for what goes on in the, uh, the department. Um, my question has to do with uh, mental health support, and um, I, I think uh, having had an encounter this year, your office did a fabulous job, but is there more support that you need? I mean, one of the things uh, that maybe not everybody is aware of, how there's this network of uh, police departments that have access to um, uh, whether it be social workers or or whatever. So your department or our department mm -hmm. already has access to professional social workers, even though the officers themselves are very well trained in handling mental health um, incidents. Can you, is there anything more that you need around that? Because we see such an increase in those types of calls. Yeah, those are things that are going on um, across the country, these are issues. So it's always going to these trainings and I'm trying to find out what different ways that people are dealing with these, uh, with these similarly challenging issues. One of the things that's a benefit for us as of late is Officer Esty's going back on the road. As you're aware, when we had some shortages on staffing, he was the first guy who volunteered, don't use overtime, I can go back on the road and cover. He's now back as our community liaison officer. So just this week, when I, I was at training last week, I got back and I was looking at some mental health calls that we had and there's always a follow-up from him. And he is kind of the, uh, he's the data management person for different resources that are available. So the officer can go and handle the call and give some suggestions that night. He does that two, three day follow-up phone call. Hey, just following up on the other night. Here are some services when things are calm. Can I provide you something? Is there anything you need to make that extra connection with people? Uh, another thing I noticed that we used is we utilize South Portland. We've developed a great relationship with them. They are short staffed. We are down there quite a bit, but there are benefits to that for us and the interactions we have with them, but we also work collaboratively with them. Everything from fixing our vehicles to sharing their mental health resources. At some point, if we start to really increase and utilize those sources, might we be asked to pitch in like we do for the harbor master or animal control officer? Yeah, if we start to get to those numbers, but right now, um, they're coming out when requested and doing a fantastic job. But as those numbers increase, those are always something that we're looking at and discussing and uh, trying to look at different ways to address these issues. Do you also see, um, I know body cams might be controversial for some, do you also see those as a training tool? The body, body cameras? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the most interesting things I saw was uh, Axon is the number one leading uh, manufacturer of body cams. And the article said that it was, they were developed for increase in transparency and accountability for police officers, and, which is great, which I'm all for. One of the challenges I see is some of the lower cost ones, you start it yourself, you press the button. And they said immediately that they were finding that a lot of officers were all of a sudden these, a lot of these challenging situations don't develop, they develop quite quickly. So officers weren't responding by pressing the button, they were grabbing their weapon, they were doing so many different things with their minds. And then it left an inherent suspicion of why didn't you turn your body camera? So now what they're turning towards is anytime you draw your holster, the blue lights go on, someone near you turns on their body cam, that click triggers your body cam. Um, but Axon, of course, is the leader in that, they're expensive. There is a large expense with it. We're talking $350,000 as a startup and then ongoing of up to $50,000 a year. And they're the leaders in technology. It's the, it's the data management that goes with it. Um, a lot of surrounding departments, they're talking to Yarmouth, is looking at them right now. But they initially wanted them and they're looking at some of the costs associated and there's some challenges going on there trying to figure out what they want. But sometimes when you cut costs, 
Um, there's some other challenges, but obviously, always with us, reviewing what we're doing, reviewing how we handle things. Are we always getting better? I think that's the, the guys, I have a couple mantras that I say, and opposed to, Nick, Neil Williams always taught me, do the right thing, was the one thing he told me. And I think I, my mantra with the guys, if you had to ask them today, would be, can we do this better? Why, what are we doing to get better every day? Just don't do it because we've always done it that way. How can we get a little bit better and a little bit better each time? Great, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up and ask about the um, PSAP. I, I noted your note in there on continued staffing shortages. Yes, yeah, so they, they just hired a... To be done about this? They're working on it, and, and we're seeing right now. They just hired a brand new executive director. He just came out and uh, spent the day out here in Cape Elizabeth with us two weeks ago. So he spent half the day with the fire department, and then the afternoon he spent with the police department. And he's basically been tasked with trying to revamp that dispatch and uh, address the challenges that are going on there. It's still new. Uh, he's still new in the position, but I got an email from him today looking for a representative from the department to... Um, to go to meetings and start looking at policy changes in a way that they can revamp uh, the PSAP in Portland and make sure that we're getting the services. And I guess more to the point, I'm curious if we're seeing any impact on our delivery of service or response time from, from that, or is that really an issue that's coming through? That uh, how, does, how does that ripple through to our response? I think... Occasionally, there are some challenges. You know, if, if you look like yesterday in Portland, they had a high-speed chase in the middle of St. Patty's Day. If we're calling, you know, sometimes that's going to take up all of their staffing to address that. They've had a lot of shootings in Portland during those times. But the officers now, we went to the 800 radios, uh, which is a large expense for us, but I was talking to Manager Sturgis earlier today. We've had some time where our radios have gone down in Portland, our traditional uh, radios. We've been able to swap over to that 800. Officers now can switch on to 800 in here when there's something going on in Portland. We have call screens that I, one of the first things I purchased when I became chief, there's a call screen that is in the squad room at the station, and there's also one up in front uh, in Ed Hunt, the clerk's office. So you can see what Portland units are going to. So now officers are having a little bit better of an idea if they're tied up in Portland. They can look at the call screen and the, they can see the calls before they're dispatched out. So officers are just doing a better job of looking at the screens, checking the screens, knowing what's going on in Portland, knowing if there's going to be some challenges, but we're working through it the best we can. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? Comments? I am. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chief. What's the next movie? The, what, the next what? The next movie. Oh, I'm not sure. We got, we got a, uh, Officer Estes with a warm weather coming, and uh, he's just procured. Someone just gave us a hot dog warmer, so we now have popcorn and hot dogs at these events as well. So. Great program. Thank you. It's, it's, it's one, great. Thing, one thing I think which is worth, worth mentioning as well as we talk about community events, and I, I had it written down, but I skimmed over it. Uh, as you're all aware, we do numerous community projects, and one of the ones that we've been doing is taking seniors in high school and doing a senior project where they come to the police department and go through the yeah. mirror things. It's funny how it's becoming full circle. I'm now getting calls from individuals who are in that class who are now in college who are pursuing law enforcement, and I just think it's a matter of time before we find that one of those individuals who went through that program ends up putting on a badge here in Cape Elizabeth, and I think that's just an amazing, if you think of what that program could have represented, I thought it was just gonna make connections, but if we could make some future staffing and recruitment and retention issues through that program, it was just another unforeseen benefit. And it's just interesting to see these kids now reaching out to saying, hey, Chief, I was on the program a couple of years ago, I'm getting ready towards graduation, not sure what I'm gonna do, I'm thinking about law enforcement. So it just speaks volumes to the officers and how they're interacting, so. Having them out in the community I know they, they did hot chocolates at the tree lighting <laughs> ceremony this year. There was a lot of families were there. They were at the ice skating rink when they were opening that with hot chocolate and interacting with all the kids. And I just think all of that just continues to, to build the connections as well. So, and, and I think people understand what we're doing to connect with the community. It's so good for the officers. It's so positive for them to just interact with people in a positive light. A lot of the times when we're called, it's during stressful situations or someone's not following their laws or their rules or they're speeding. But to be able to just go and have a normal conversation and the officers to feel appreciated and have those connections. And then when something critical does happen, then you've got those relationships already developed and the trust. So, But it's also, it's the officers. I can send any of them to any event and not worry. They, they just love it. So it's been great. Well done. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Mr. Chairman, that, up next we'll have uh, the Thomas Memorial Library with our... Yeah, that's on page... 
uh, page 149, and Rachel Davis is here to talk about all the great events and programming and operations at the library. Yes, um, yeah. So a little bit of background. Actually, just off of what um, Chief Fenton just said, uh, in terms of attracting those younger um, workers in future years, uh, three of our current um, permanent employees at the library used to come to the library as children, and two of whom were volunteers with me as children, <laughs> and they are now uh, regular employees in the library. So, so we have a, a good track record of keeping people uh, engaged. Um, and uh, um, to jump ahead just a little bit, the, the only, um, or the main increase in our personnel line um, is uh, uh, putting in a little bit of funding there to try something that I've been wanting to do for a few years, which is to uh, create a 10 hour a week page position for specifically geared toward a high school student to um, have a high school student come in and uh, have regular work hours and gain some work experience and get paid for it. Um, and, and hopefully we can work with the high school to sort of uh, find candidates. Although right now we, we have some uh, teen volunteers who are good candidates for such a position as well. So um, it would either be five hours a week or 10 hours a week uh, at minimum wage starting in the, the coming fiscal year. So I'm hoping that that, uh, that comes to fruition and becomes a permanent um, opportunity that we can offer to young people. Um, so just some basics, the, the library is open six days a week, 46 hours to the public, uh, with some additional evening hours. Some of, a lot of our uh, evening programs continue past the library's closing time, which is uh, part of the way the, the building was uh, um, created to, to be able to close off the uh, collection areas so we can have things going on after hours and not have to staff the whole building. Um, so um, we have nine full-time uh, positions now and three part-time, which are each 18 hours. Um, and that is a change from last year. During the year, we had a little bit of uh, staff turnover, some of our part-time people leaving to go to full-time positions elsewhere, and we were able to take uh, those positions those smaller positions and, and combine them and add some extra hours. So we're now um, able to, I hope, retain our staff a little bit better with, um, with more robust offerings of full-time positions. Um, so it's, it's a, obviously the largest uh, portion of our budget is personnel, and in part um, it's due to the, the need to staff both floors um, adequately at all of our open hours. So we have two public service desks, and we can't leave one person by themselves. And since we have evening hours and Saturday hours, it gets a little tricky. So um, so that's that's our largest portion of the budget, followed, of course, appropriately by our book budget, um, which we're I'm asking for a little bit of an increase. So we haven't asked for an increase in a number of years, but inflation uh, you know, affects books as well as everything else. And, and uh, so just a little bit of an increase there. Um, but otherwise, things are pretty straightforward. I, I did change, or I asked Christy to change the names of some of our accounts um, so that in the future we can make it a little more transparent. We had such a large, um, a large number of things that were applied to miscellaneous expenses, both in the, the library's um, regular account and in our special funds. And a good portion of those miscellaneous um, supplies are things that could more appropriately be in other um, other accounts so that we so we re, we changed advertising the name of advertising to um, program supplies which uh, I'm not sure that that's changed in the narrative or not but um, but the actual account names have changed a little bit so we just used ones that we changed ones that we didn't really use uh, to things that were more appropriate um, that better reflected uh, you know where the where the funds are actually being expended, so and that's that's pretty much otherwise it's pretty straightforward. And then any questions? Yeah, um, I have a couple. Number one, I want to say thank you very much for the email I get all the time about all the fabulous <laughs> programs you have. Not that I have time to attend them, but I go, wow, this is this is great. So thank you. Um, I look at budget for 
audiovisual supplies. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what you put up, but in, in 2023, we had uh, $6,705, and it looks like we've got 4000 now. It, are you doing less around audiovisual? I, when I was down in your downstairs room doing a presentation and we Zoom uh, and have mm -hmm. people in attendance, you don't put that under audiovisual? No, that, that, um, so the audiovisual supply resources really is physical audiobooks and DVDs. Oh, okay. So what I did was shifted some of those funds over into our electronic resources, our e-books and e-audiobooks, yep. because that's yeah. where the use is. There's really just not... Um, our DVDs do circulate. People do still borrow DVDs in our collection. It sort of leans heavily on things that you might not have easy streaming access to or free access to. Um, but the books on CD... Um, most people don't even have CD players in their cars anymore, so it's it's better to... I've just shifted those funds to sort of... In the past few years, I've just been eking off a little bit from that line and putting them into our e-books and audio, e-audio books. Um, but as in terms of the Zoom, uh, that, that goes under our um, miscellaneous contract supplies because we pay for an annual um, okay. professional license. Okay. My other question has to do with... Um, you already said you've got one of your dream things happening, which is having a student uh, yep. come and work. Uh, directionally, if you had to think into the future, what would you, what would you like to see? I, I think I see what you're already doing, and I go, there must be this other vision or part. Do of you it. mean in terms of personnel? No, in terms oh. of programming. Oh, of what we want to do. All those kind of things. Well. I am working with the Thomas Memorial Library Committee on strategic planning, and I th think it's a little premature to, to say where we're going to go. I, what, I'm, I'm very proud of what we're doing and all of the different areas of focus that we have been able to sort of um, reach with our different programming um, and our collections, and I just want to be a little bit more deliberate about it. Um, and so one of, one of my goals is to increase... Um, uh, resources, uh, services, and collections for people with um, disabilities. Um, I want to sort of create some uh, sensory-friendly browsing time before the library opens for, um, for adults with um, intellectual and uh, developmental disabilities in particular, and just be more sensitive to making the library a comfortable accessible place for that audience. Um, so that's one of the areas of focus that, that I don't think we are, we're, we're there yet. Um, but in general, we, we really are focused on building a sense of community in the library, making it a place that is not just... I mean, the library is different things to different people. Some people just come in and pick up the book that they might have on hold. Some people just use our, our um, electronic resources. But for a lot of people, it's that opportunity to be in a space that isn't their home, that isn't work, where they can be among their neighbors, their other people, um, and, and make connections with people they might not have, uh, you know, had an, have any other opportunity to in a place that, that isn't charging you money to do that, and um, and so I I I think the underlying um, goal of all of our staff is to try and and find ways to to create that sense of community and make the library sort of that that um, welcoming place where you can just be and be among actual physical human beings. Um, so. So yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, a year from now I'll probably have a, a better, more focused way of explaining our goals as we continue on the strategic planning process. But, um, but the areas where I see the, the needs, the things that I want to focus on are, are the accessibility um, issues and, and as well as, as safety, um, which uh, the, the intercom system that you all approved last week um, will go a long way toward, but just trying to develop a, a comprehensive safety plan and, and making sure that staff feel safe and that it's safe for the public as well. I'm glad you're doing a strategic plan. So a year from now, we should 
be seeing the results I hope so, that? yeah. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, okay, good. Um, thanks, Rachel. I, sure. Um, I, I just um, was curious, so I, I, I know this isn't an apples to apples comparison, um, but I, looking at the book ac books and publications acquisition budget and the e-books, e it's, mm -hmm. it's roughly you know, a little bit more than three to one in mm -hmm. favor of, of traditional print materials. Um, I'm just curious how that's reflected in our circulation numbers. Well, the e-books and audiobooks are very popular. But we we don't um, we're part of a consortium, so the bulk of that that collection is a shared collection among um, you know the main the main collection is purchased uh, by the state library, and then individual libraries contribute. Um, so so it's, it it definitely is not apples to apples. Also in the in the sense that. Um, e-books are just licensed in the... They are licensed, they also expire, um, and they're also two, three, or four times the amount of a print yeah. print book. So so there's that. Um, that said, I, I do think it's a, um, it's something that's, that's well used, and um, I would say probably in terms of, if I think about our monthly usage, um, it's not that great compared to what our physical materials are. Um, and, and in part, that's probably due to the, the it's counterintuitive. You would think that if something is an electronic uh, resource, it's just unlimited and available, and you, know, you buy it, and everybody can use it. But that's not how publishers uh, <laughs> deal with libraries and, and electronic resources. So it's one user, one copy. Um, and so we're, although we're part of this consortium, um, each individual library can purchase copies of e-books and e-audio books for the, the shared collection with the caveat that those titles are, uh, get priority to our own patrons. And so I do try and um, I take a look at what our print circulation is, see what's popular there, see how many things I look at holds on titles, um, and uh, and make my purchases based on on that. And if I look and see that a you know say um, Ann Patchett's latest book has a two-year wait, <laughs> I will definitely buy a copy that then the wait. Uh, that instantly goes out to one of our patrons once because they're already on hold for it. If I buy that copy, it goes out. But I will say, um, in terms of print circulation, we're part of the Minerva Consortium, which is over 60 libraries in the state. Um, our circulation is consistently within the top 10 of all of those libraries every month, uh, alongside communities that are much larger than ours, like South Portland and Scarborough. So we are... Um, we are one of the busiest libraries in the state, and given the size of our population compared to those, it's, I'm very proud that people use our library a lot. Um, and, uh, and definitely books are, um, are not going away anytime soon, print, print books. So people do appreciate it, and some people prefer. I mean, I, I think most people actually prefer a print book, but yeah. Thank you. Sure. I'm guilty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm guilty of. Oh, you're guilty Prefer, of it. Preferring a print book. Oh, yes. Questions? <laughs> E-books oh. would take up a lot less room on my nightstand, though. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have a stack like that high. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Kindles are easier to travel with, I will admit. <laughs> but it's just another example of a, another great resource in town. The, the number of, of uh, citizens in town that work as trustees with you and... Um, I don't know, just every, almost every department that's reported tonight, there's just been a lot of citizen involvement in, in all of them, whether they're working on the elections or they're volunteering at the fire department or they're trustees with you, but uh, just another example of why uh, so many people love living in this town. So thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Do we want to go into the special accounts or are you going to do those later? The to, yeah, if you want to, you want to go want, up to that. I don't, yeah. I don't didn't know oh, if I, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier. Oh, no, no, that's okay. It's just um, last year I remember I got up and sat that's down right. and you oh, that's right. like, yeah. oh, no, you should have gotten to deal with the other one. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, let's see. So that's page, uh, I have it marked here. Um, 
182. And there, there's not a whole lot to add, just that, um, speaking of citizen- fault. I'm new at this, so. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> speaking of citizen involvement, um, we are just so fortunate to have people who regularly donate to the library, either directly to us, um, through just donations or memorial gifts or um, bequests in their uh, in their estate planning, um, and indirectly through the the library foundation. And so a lot of the a lot of the prog I mean most of the programs that we're able to offer, as well as all of our program supplies, um, come from from those donated funds. There there are things that. You know, if, if I were only working with the town's budget, I would be pretty skimpy on, like, purchasing craft supplies for a craft program or um, holiday decorations or, you know, anything like that. And, and these donated funds allow us to enhance our services in, in such a significant way um, that I, I think, you know, it would be, I mean, when you talk about wants and needs, um, a, lot of, a lot of the the things that our donated funds do for us are, are more on the line of those wants, but they do so much for our community and I think people benefit from them tremendously. So I, I'm just really um, uh, so incredibly fortunate uh, to, to be in this community where people support the library, um, not only just by, by using the library, but by donating to us as well. So that allows us to do so much more than we otherwise um, would be able to do. So, um, so you know, I've, I've sort of outlined, I mean, most of those gift funds come are, are from the foundation, um, but we do have the, the annual Chase gift that goes toward um, mostly large print books, but um, another area of focus um, that I didn't mention is just increasing uh, services for seniors, and one of the things that we want to be able to do with, um, with some of those Chase funds is create memory kits um, that can circulate things that are sort of brain boosting um, uh, puzzles, games, resources um, that uh, we can circulate to people to sort of help help train your brain and uh, keep your brain active. Uh, so things like that, um, we, we're fortunate to be able to draw on these different accounts that are your mark for specific things like senior services or um, our general uh, library agency fund, which has uh, been built up so much over the years that we had those funds to devote to that intercom system that you all approved last week last week, so, um, so yeah, we're just uh, thrilled to be able to, to have these extra funds and happy to answer, answer any questions about them. Yes? I, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a, a general question, it's not specifically budget, I don't think, but mm -hmm. curious about the, uh, the archiving strategy for the town. Do you have any interface with, like, for example, the police chief mentioned, you know, if they have, let's say they had some old murder cases from 1890 or something, would those documents stay with the police department, go to the new historic society? They would go to the historical society. I mean, we, we aren't really uh, an archive. We don't right. have the space for that. We do keep some, you know, town reports and things that people will want to refer to, but they're more current. Um, but historical things always go to the, the, and I think they are officially the town archive, so yeah, <clears throat> they go to this. But we work a lot with the Historical Society, and a, a, our original uh, collection, uh, the William Widgery Thomas collection, is now stored at the, um, it used to be in the library in our uh, conference room. It's now at um, the Historical Society, and we are working on getting all of the materials that um, went from the library to the Historical Society noted in our catalog so that if people are looking for those, those items, they will see that the location is the, the Historical Society. So that's one of our long-term projects. Great. Thank you. On that one, Mr. Is that it? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Here, so appreciate it. Sure. And Mr. Chairman, the next item that we have is the human services uh, side. That starts at page 154, uh, also at tab 8. And this says uh, human services, also the, uh, the other different intergovernmental 
uh, items as well. Uh, in this uh, section, we'll have our, our, our county assessment, which the town has no, um, no control over that side of it, but it does flow through the taxes. So as you notice with your tax rate, you'll have the town budget uh, component, the school component, and the county assessment is also there. Uh, also, our memberships with the Greater Portland Council of Governments is within here, as and the Maine Municipal Association uh, membership for the town. And then under our uh, social service agencies that we have there, you'll notice that these are all different organizations that the town has uh, made contributions to historically, and uh, that would go through uh, from Maine Healthcare at Home, Maine Behavioral Healthcare, VNA Hospice, and other different uh, organizations that have provided services to members of the community. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, as well under the actuals, you may notice that sometimes there may, that may not be populated yet, but that may be a function of timing and them providing their request for funding for that year. Uh, also within this is general assistance. So you'll see that the, uh, the bottom line at uh, three, th uh, line 3490Z, uh, that is the amount that the town uses to fund the general assistance needs in the community. So I would pay for the housing max, or the housing, uh, housing assistance, uh, grocery assistance, utility assistance that uh, general assistance recipients uh, request. You want to talk about the? Go ahead. I actually had a, um, another different question aside from general assistance, um, but I, I'm curious about that too. Um, the county assessment line, um, that is a fairly significant increase. Is that reflective of an actual increase or is that just the shift in the way that the county's budget year lines with ours? Or some combination of the two? Sure, sure, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the combination of both. Okay. Uh, so what you'll find is this year we had a, roughly a 17% increase on the county assessment and that's specifically uh, related to county spending but also due to increases that the count that uh, we found in our state valuation. So we went up by, I think, I think it was like $28 million or something along those lines in, the, in, our, in our increase. And it was at a greater level than other communities within. Uh, like we get hammered, sorry. Uh, we saw a substantial increase on, the, on our county assessment as did, uh, I know Cumberland did, talking with Bill Shane about that and other towns, mostly Cumberland County, coastal, count, coastal towns saw a greater level of increase in our municipal valuation that from the state value that increased our percentage share of the overall county assessment. So we had that part of it. And this is year two. The county did last year convert to a fiscal year uh, starting July 1. Historically, in, and when I say historically, I mean forever, until last year the county was on a calendar fiscal year. So they converted last year and last year, and, and they gave towns the, the option to, to, to either pay it all at once or pay it over two years, three years, or up to five years at no interest charge. So uh, we took the default, and just over the next five, uh, this year and the next three after that, uh, they had one year, uh, one year or a six-month special assessment. So they ran, they finished their fiscal year last year on December 31st, and then they ran a short-term budget from July, what, January 1 to June 30th. And then uh, the assessment that we had there, each, each town had an allocation for that six-month budget that they had. So we're in year two of paying off that, that segment of it. But the, it's a combination of those two coming together. And, and so our portion of the county tax, or our county assessment is increased by 17%. What's the underlying increase in the county budget? Just out of curiosity, I mean, I think it's around six percent was the was their gross increase. But we, the, as what the basically, it's almost like a reval that they did there as well. So they had reallocated. So maybe Baldwin didn't grow by as much, or uh, other towns within Cumberland County didn't grow by as much percentage wise as Cape Elizabeth and other towns did. So that's how they uh, that's how they reallocated that out. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Jordan. Um, okay, I have a couple of questions sure. and comments. Um, as I look through um, organizations which we um, uh, contribute to, have contributed to in the past, um, 
I, I kind of I assess them based on what I assume our um, population here in town would be using. Um, one of the ones that uh, I've learned about over the past uh, year or so is um, Spurink's um, program in Portland called The Living Room, which is really going to become a model for the state as to how you uh, can um, intervene in mental health crisis without having the person have to go to the emergency. So it's, it's really, you can, you can direct uh, people toward uh, the living room. Um, it's a great model. There's uh, counselors right there. They very quickly try to get them into programming, uh, but it's uh, ideally not sending them to a uh, inpatient uh, approach. It's more of uh, can they work within an outpatient approach. And so, I I wanted to put that program on our radar. The other question I have, and Matt, maybe you can help me with this, is um, Portland's homeless shelter. I know, uh, I don't know if any county dollars go to that at all. I don't know exactly all the funding streams. I do imagine that uh, Portland has some sort of federal funding that helped to create that, but I would think that uh, Cape Elizabeth might want to consider uh, some sort of um, donation to the homeless shelter in Portland, uh, because Portland is definitely um, uh, carries the brunt of many of those services. Um, and I don't know what other communities do relative to contributing to that. I, mean, it's, I know South Portland is starting to look at their, their own, and I, Scarborough has some sort of stopgap. Uh, but I think we need to kind of consider how we would support that. I also look at um, family crisis services, day one for substance abuse issues. Um, Hospice of Maine and Sexual Assault Response Services. And I would personally like to propose that uh, for Family Crisis Services, Day One, Hospice of Maine and Sexual Assault Response Services, that we increase those donations to uh, $2,500 each. I would go higher, but I don't know if I could get my fellow counselors to follow that lead. Um, Southern Maine Agency on Aging is another one. They provide a lot of services for seniors, and, uh, and I know that there are seniors in this community that uh, use those services. I would uh, suggest a $2,500 um, amount there as well. Um, relative to the one I mentioned, Spurinks, the living room, I would start with a um, you know, $2,500 and um, just uh, t demonstrate that actually I'd go to 5000 because of all the mental health issues, but um, I, I'll be a little more conservative. Uh, the shelter in Portland, I think we should look at uh, upwards of $5,000. The others I'd keep the same at this point. As long as we're looking at some, talking about adding some, I would like to, to uh, ask the council to consider one of the, one of the uh, places, families I know in this town have been able to get support for mental health is, and their children is a Center for Grieving Children. Um, I know. Uh, oh yeah, that's a great one, perfect. Yeah, so, perfect. Uh, um, and we have a number of, we've actually got a couple of citizens that have gone through and been on their boards and, and whatnot. So uh, we, I would like to see if we could consider uh, a $2,500 contribution to the Center for Grieving Children. I'd support all of those changes. We can take care of that, easy, easy to do. 
And that, that should yeah. keep us at probably where we're at from a budgeting, adding those increases yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't change that. Yeah, it's, it's not gonna be painful at all. It's, uh, and I know that they, you know, most folks are great, the, extremely grateful for the support that the towns do because a lot of towns back in 07, 08 stopped. Mm -hmm. And Cave Elizabeth has kept that tradition up for forever. So uh, I know we have great responses. And day one, you know, uh, uh, they they are they actually are our tenant at Fort Williams as well, and they they couldn't be better to work with. They're just a great, great, great group, and the, the work that they do is huge. So all these are great. Or we'll, we'll we'll take care of it. We'll put them all in. Could you ask? Um, maybe you could ask. Uh, um, What's her name? Um, the new city manager in Portland. Oh, Daniel West. Yeah, maybe you could ask her, um, you know, if we donate uh, $5,000, what impact does that have? Um, because knowing that impact would be um, a good thing. Um, and ask her if there are other communities that also donate and what amounts they may be donate. Sure. Um, and I wish Paul was still here because uh, he could explain the, the living rooms program. It was just a, a fabulous, fabulous experience. Well, maybe we could do that as a follow-up. We could get some more information on yeah. that. As, so. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll start making calls tomorrow as far as finding out the details as to, you know, homes, homes for placing the checks to. Basically, we'll reach out to their admins and, and yeah, if we can get those details taken care of really well. People generally are happy to, and I was talking with Councilor Thompson today earlier, and just about this, about the programming that we have here, and you know, the Hospice of Maine is one of our uh, one of our accounts, and uh, you know, they unfortunately all of our community they they have impact and, and outreach in, in all of our communities, and uh, so uh, you know, we see on, in their annual letters for requests for funding that they provide us, uh, you know, the number of services that they do, uh, that they've provided within the community uh, over the over the past year, and it's astounding. Uh, but they, these are all great committees, so yeah, we, we can take care of adding those to the list for sure, not a problem at all. Yes. Um, this probably falls more under 103, 4,000 on page 158, um, but I also recall that we got an email from, I think that you forwarded, um, uh, Councilor Thompson, uh, yes. with the request about the, um, what do they call it when the seniors stay over? Project, gradu Project graduation. Oh, thank you. Um, is that something that we wanted? I, I thought, I believe the request was at this budget year, but then also discussion for upcoming. Is that something to discuss here, or is that more germane for a regular council meeting? Well, we, we talked to the two gentlemen that came tonight, and uh, let them know that what well, we, we talked and we, we said we were, because it's pretty new and it's, it's pretty school related that we'd, we'd put it on the April agenda. I hope that'd be okay with everybody. And I think they're gonna come to the April 8th council meeting to make a formal uh, request at that point, probably under our citizens uh, discussion of items not on the agenda. And then I, I said probably the April 22nd uh, budget workshop would be a good opportunity then after the formally re after making the formal request there that it could be uh, brought up as the, on the home stretch. Thank you, that sounds like a great plan. Can you, when you, we have that conversation, could you refresh my memory at that time on what we did for the playground and what we did for robotics? Sure, sure, be great. I can do that. And then, uh, and then yes, going on to page 158, I know uh, Councillor Anderson had, had brought up uh, a question related to the senior citizens tax relief. Uh, that right now is based on what we currently have for amounts, but uh, we may want to flag that for when uh, council wants to have a discussion. I think- We wanted to increase that. Yes, yeah, so uh, if we can, I, I'd like to flag that for uh, the later workshop in April, just to, after working with Clint uh, to see you know, if the, if the benefit level, you know, if it expanded up to, you know, if you expanded the, uh, the, the floor or the ceiling for the uh, median income or the, what that income amount would be, as well as expanded that level of benefit if you went from the $500 cap up to say 750, something along those lines. And we just need to do the math on that, but we can have that ready for, for that time. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, Thank you. perfect.
And then, of course, our Family Fund Day funding has stayed level, but uh, they, they're going on the week before this year. So they've switched off from Family, uh, family Fund Day is not going to be on uh, Father's Day weekend. It's actually, I think, the weekend before is what they're, they're looking to do. So uh, trying to change, change things up for this year. But they have the fireworks already uh, lined up. The week before that. Yeah, the week even before June that. Second, yeah. Yep. So it's going to be busy three weeks at uh, at the fourth. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just go back to the other item. Now, this came up in the year past, and at the risk of looking like the mean spirited person in the room, <laughs> um, the you know all of the the causes are great and merited, and the but where do we draw the line? Policy-wise, hey, my concern is coming back two years. This could be two pages of giving to great. good causes, and so, huh? <laughs> but it, I mean, I've never been comfortable with taking public tax dollars, putting them into nonprofits when people could just contribute with their own monies. So now we're taking taxpayer monies. But these are great causes. So, like Easter Seals got to zero. So, why do they get zero, or someone else gets zero, but? not the Portland homeless shelter or, you know, I, we have Preble, we have a generous amount for the Preble resource. I mean, so I just, I just feel we need to have a pretty clear policy or this could become controversial and problematic. I mean, I think, you know, again, I, I, all good causes, but how are we going to draw the line in doing this? You know, I don't know. As you know, I always love policy discussions. Um, and, and, and I actually probably apply Penny's own policy as I look at this because I go, what is our population in Cape Elizabeth? Um, of that population, what services might they be seeking um, within um, all of the social services in, you know, the Cumberland County area, uh, and um, if we look at uh, Cape Elizabeth and the fact that we, I can't imagine that Cape Elizabeth will build a homeless shelter, but we know that homeless shelters are needed. So the fact that I can't imagine, unless you want to put it on the agenda and we can talk about it. Um, I can't imagine that we will be building a homeless shelter in Cape Elizabeth. So therefore, I, from a, um, a, a, a social purpose and societal perspective, I don't think any one city should carry the brunt of providing services. So those are kind of my, um, my uh, check boxes. So I think a policy could be wonderful, uh, um, but I, that's what I use for my criteria. I think, he's, I think he's asking more, not something major like that, more like the smaller things, the, the different organizations that we're supporting, and how do you dis differentiate between, how do you decide which of those organizations you're going to support? I mean. The greatest the population of that will be served. So that's the other piece of my, which goes to your policy. So where is the greatest population going to be served? And when you look at the number of mental health issues and the number of mental health calls going on in this town and the number of people that can, uh, that need to access some highly, um, I would say, outpatient services that are delivered very well, then that's what I start to think about. And I, and I will continue to say this, Portland, Maine should not carry the brunt of what is needed for services in Cumberland County. So. Yes, to well, and to your point, uh, Councilor Reiniger, if you go down this list and, and we were to utilize the approach that Penny was talking about, People in Cape Elizabeth do benefit from Maine Behavioral Health Care. Uh, they benefit from the VNA Hospice, the Center for Ther Therapeutic, SMA Opportunity, all, a lot of these. Now, 
some some of it, of what Councilor Jordan is talking is probably expanded beyond that. Uh, but I think a lot of the ones that we've got on here, I mean, even adding the living room, I, look, it, if if we know based on what Councilor Jordan said, the chief could probably clue us in on how we're utilizing that. Um, and obviously the Center for Grieving Children, the citizens in this town have benefited from that. So whether we go to the additional a point of how, how responsible is Cape Elizabeth for uh, helping assisting Portland with all the issues they've got to deal with. I'm not sure how, how much beyond these we do, but I think it's worthy of a, of a conversation. But I look at this list and I can, many of the organizations on that, our citizens do access that and do benefit from those that we're supporting, so. We, we haven't left, we haven't uh, deleted folks unless they haven't asked. Uh, usually it's been, it's been historically, they've, uh, the, the list hasn't changed much over the years, but they've been items that uh, they've requested, you know, and, and sent their details, like RTP, regional transportation, you know, with folks who, who are a transportation challenge uh, due to different, different reasons. Uh, they provide services out here. So they'll send us a letter with their request, say we provided services to X amount of people in the community for the year. And then uh, then the Easter Seals uh, zeroed that out because they, they just stopped requesting funding. And so uh, we carried them for a couple of years when they had not requested at all. So this year I said, well, if they haven't, you know, if we looked at over a three year here history that they hadn't uh, requested the funding, then uh, we're just basically adding it to the unassigned fund balance uh, at the end of the year because it just falls, falls off from that point. But, but the others that, you know, we've had this list and, and, and added or deleted as, as, you know, maybe a service has has ceased to, to be provided, so they'd let us know that we're not gonna be requesting funding anymore or someone else has, has added uh, added on services as well. So that's kinda, it's, but we haven't, there hasn't been a litmus test to say yes you can or not. We just, we, we'll just bring it forward if someone sends a request for funding during the year and uh, I'll keep those letters. And then as they come along, uh, and I'll add it to the list and if the council decides that they'd like to make, uh, make an assistant donation, uh, that's kinda how that's been manage versus saying, uh, no, I don't think, you know, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna find you this year. Usually it's, it's been pretty open as far as the process for folks requesting, if that helps. We're not choosing winners and losers. We're just, uh, we're just keeping a tally of the scorecard. And we are contributing a million eight hundred thousand dollars to the county government. So we're, we are making a contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Good portion of that goes to the jail. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a whole other, se whole other section of conversation there. But <laughs> right. what else do we need to get through tonight? Do you think? That, that, that would be it for this evening, Mr. Right. Chair. And then, uh, and then a preview of coming attractions for for uh, Thursday night. It's mostly the uh, the J the J Reynolds experience and uh, community services, and then uh, facilities as well. We'll get us started at six. Right. Six o'clock. Yeah, and Fort Williams is part of, uh, with, uh, with Kathy uh, Raftis's uh, Fort Williams Park, as well as uh, Capital and Debt uh, as well that evening. Do we need a motion to adjourn? You're good to go, Mr. Okay. Chair. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.